Hi, welcome to the Soft Adornments Knitting Podcast. My name is Natasha. I am a knitter and spinner based in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm here to talk about what I've been working on. Um, today it's going to be mostly spinning, mostly yarn, um, but I kind of wanted to do something a little different with today's video. Um, I don't have very much to show you in terms of knitting updates because um, I've just been spinning a lot. So I wanted to do like my brief update, um, talk about just other stuff I've been doing and maybe spend some time just spinning and chatting. Um, so if that sounds good to you, then grab a snack, a project, and you know, let's, let's hang out a little, a little bit. So yeah, right now it's, um, the afternoon. It's a really beautiful, um, kind of like you know, like lightly cloudy day, but like it's not overcast. It's just like nice soft lighting. Um, there's a tree outside uh, one of my windows here that's blooming with flowers. I picked up some flowers from the farmer's market today um, and uh, just got back from there as well as the uh, flea market that was happening um, pretty, pretty near where I live, um, where I just got the sweatshirt sleeves thingy and i mean i love it like look at these colors it's from a brand called new affection and i think they like upcycle clothes and stuff and the person i bought this from was wearing a kufia so that was really cool to see and yeah i mean i just love it like i have like body temperature like regulation issues <laughs> i don't know if you'd call it issues but like i like you know i'm either like way too cold um you know with like icy toes that annoy my partner <laughs> or i'm like too warm and like i get to be like the space heater furnace so like i don't know just having like sleeves is like really nice um i think i talked in my last podcast a little bit about like those sleeves patterns that are coming out and like i really like to half put on a sweatshirt like just put it, my arms in the sleeves and like go around like that. So this is kind of giving me that and like the neck's not too tight, which I like, and there's a little hood. So I really like this. Um, I'm also wearing a, oh no, what's it called? You know, like the really, really old Jessie Mae pattern. Um, it's like the bralette pattern, ripple, ripple bralette, yes. And I made this years ago. This was like one of my first garments I ever made. And I made this in Through the Wardrobe Yarn Co's. Um, it was a sock set um, that was, I think, either based on The Secret Garden or Alice in Wonderland. And I don't remember which one. Or maybe it was Through the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, no. It was one of the first two. But anyway... So I made this with a sock set from Through the Wardrobe Yarn Company, and I'm pretty sure it was Secret Garden themed, which is like why it's like kind of green and like pinks, and um, the straps are like, the straps are this like contrast color here. Um, and yeah, like as soon as I bought this sweatshirt, I put it on over my t-shirt that I was wearing, but when I got home, I thought it would be really cute to pair it with like one of these tank tops. Um, so that's what I'm wearing. Um, you know, the pattern... Uh, is really simple to make. I probably should make a new one because this is made, this was made when I like was making everything like a size too big for me. And like this is meant to be like a negative ease pattern, but this has more like zero inches of ease, maybe even a little positive ease because like it's just, it's so loose on me which means I can't really wear this outside the house unless I do like to layer this over dresses. Like I have this patchwork dress that I got made um, from a local um, garment maker designer and I love to wear this over it and it actually kind of looks like it's part of the dress. But on its own, I can only wear it inside the house because just everything moves and nothing stays secure. But because we're just sitting, we can wear it on the podcast. <laughs> But I really could use another one. Also, this was back when I, like, didn't think to customize patterns for myself. Like, I think I knit this just with, like, the um, the patterns, like, 
suggested length which is like way too short or way shorter than I would normally knit now but I I don't know I, I just would like read a pattern and be like okay okay got it captain you know just deferring to other people and not thinking about what I want or need um and you know we make it work but we're in a place now where we can be more honest about when we need like shaping when we need to like customize like length or whatever um all of the straps are like way too long so anyway I don't mean to complain a lot about this pattern it's mostly just that I, I made this when I was like a year or two into my knitting journey and so I like you know I made a garment it was great now I'm better at knitting now I know more about my body and like what I want out of a garment I feel more comfortable with my body so I don't you know fear negative ease anymore um, but I really like the colors still so I still like to pull it out from time to time and I thought the colors looked really nice with this sleeve situation so that's what I'm wearing um, and yeah, I've had a pretty nice day. I also got some flowers that are out in my living room. Um, and, you know, just trying to get into the spring mood. The spring spirit. Right now, I think I'm having a hard time making progress on my knitting projects. Mostly because I've been focusing all my energy into this big test knit sweater. But it's on chunky needles, like size 15s. And I don't typically knit on size 15s. And there's cables in Intarsia, and my gauge fully changed from swatch to garment. Like, I swatched it, it was great, like, it was perfectly within the, you know, gauge requirements. But now that, like, I've knit the entire body, I think maybe it was like the weight of all of that fabric just made my gauge, like, a little too loose and now it's like way too big on me and i will finish it but i i'm worried that it won't get a lot of wear which is a shame because the colors are really cute and like the pattern's really cute um so yeah i'm working on sleeve one i need to redo the neckline um so we'll see if i if i bring it out and um I'm going to hold off on naming <laughs> the pattern and who it's by um, until I know whether I like it or not. So that's kind of the risk with test knits, isn't it? Like, you know, it looks really cute in the picture, but then, you know, you don't know whether it's going to turn out well or not. But that being said, I am doing another test knit right now, but it's on like lace weight needles fingering weight yarn definitely more in my comfort zone so I don't feel too worried about it um yeah let's just start there so I am testing the curious crop by what Lydia made Lydia Morrow and I love knitting her patterns I've tested for her before and it was great um all of her patterns are like really thoughtfully written and with so many shaping options and like as she's released patterns they just get like better and better and more and more fit minded um which like totally makes sense because i'm pretty sure lydia's background is in like making like intimate wear which like you really need to have a good understanding of bodies and how to shape how to shape garments for different types of bodies so i don't know it's really cool to see like that level of mindfulness be brought into a knitting pattern like you know short row shaping for bust darts like that's great but like you know she has like four or five different like cup sizes and like um just other types of like uh, some patterns have like hip shaping so just like a lot of really mindfully like designed elements and with this pattern there's a like a little like cut out here and I'm really hoping it like lands perfectly like around this tattoo. I think that'd be super cute. Lydia's crop with the hole in it shows off her chest tattoo and it looks so cool. Um, but I'm making it out of these Kindred Red Folk Sock um, fingering weight non-superwash yarns. 
Um, I feel like these are very much like kindred red colors, like pink and red. Um, I was originally going to do, I was originally going to um, make some more lackadaisical mitts out of these two, um, kind of like a brighter, but like still a low contrast kind of vibe. But um, I still have the yarn from my original lackadaisical mitts. Um, so I could totally make like another pair in that colorway or even just invert the colorway. Um, so we'll see. I might do that instead because I just thought it would be so, so cute to like have a top out of these yarns instead of just like accessories, which there's nothing wrong with. But I just thought it'd be fun to like have like a super, super pop of color. And like what's funny about this project is that it's on um, like a non-standard size of needle for me. Like it's on like 1.5s and 2.5s US, which I had to buy especially. Um, and I broke the first pair of 1.5s. I can't explain how it happened. I literally just like, I had them in my tote bag and I like grabbed my tote bag and then just snap. It was really scary. <laughs> um, it was during a movie too. It was during Hundreds of Beavers, which is a cuckoo bananas looney tunes live action adventure like you know if you just want like goofy haha -ha, like looney tunes banana movie just yeah go see hundreds of beavers it was wild <laughs> um but yeah like somebody was passing in front of me and i just grabbed my bag and it snapped and i was just like <gasps> okay <laughs> like during the movie and then i saw after it i was like yep it definitely broke so i of course since it's a test knit you know i have no time to waste so i bought some more needles but this time i bought metal ones um so that i won't be scared of breaking them so i am obviously not very far i'm just on like the provisional cast on and i always cast my waist yarn on way too tight and so i'm like really struggling but we'll get through it we will get through it friends i know we will um so yeah like with the two colors um i was thinking of doing like honest to be completely honest with you i don't think i've decided what i'm gonna do yet but i was going to do intarsia because i wanted like some cool like design or something but like everything i was sketching out just felt way too busy especially with like considering the like you know central element of the garment which is like this hole and so i kind of scrapped the intarsia idea also because i don't want to think too hard while i'm trying to follow a pattern and because i couldn't find or figure out a design that i liked so instead of adapting the pattern to be intarsia i'm gonna do it in the round but i'm gonna do kind of like probably just like big blocks of color um and i was thinking of like orange ribbing hem pink body up till the point to split for sleeves or sleeve holes and then switching to the other color and then so that would be like orange ribbing pink body and then it would be orange body all the way up to the top with like pink ribbing here, pink ribbing here, and pink ribbing here. So I don't know, I think it could be kind of cute. Um, and like the reason being that I can't use just like one yarn for the whole body and then the other yarn for the like ribbing and stuff because I don't have enough yardage for that. So I have to be a little bit more creative about how I use it, but I think it'll be cute. I don't know, it'll just kind of be like a like a two-toned kind of a vibe. Um, but I'm really excited for that pattern. Like, I'm excited to have that garment. And it's like, I'm trying to, like, chase that feeling more instead of just being like, ooh, that's a cool pattern, I'm going to make that like I used to. Now I'm like, okay, like, I want this in my wardrobe. I want this garment in my wardrobe. I'm trying to be more, like, fashion-minded, you know? Um, and it's just, like, it's going to hit nicely. It's going to, like, fit nicely. I'm very, very um another lydia pattern that i'm kind of like working on and i don't think i actually showed it in this podcast did i i have a very bad memory i'm sorry guys if i have i apologize but <laughs> um my rumble raglan no partner pullover i always mess them up my partner pullover um 
that I made for Rhinebeck last year, I literally was like knitting it up until the day before. And I like did a did the fastest blocking I've probably ever done in my life. And I was like ha hair drying it like the morning of and it was a mess. <laughs> it worked for the trip, but because I didn't block it, I literally just like washed it and like dried it flat. It kind of shrunk also because it's super wash. So like it kind of like shrunk a little bit. So like not only is the length like up till here now, like where if I lift my arms up, you're going to get under boob, which you don't want in a sweater. I don't want that in my sweater. Not every sweater, at least. I say while I'm wearing a micro sweatshirt. But <laughs> also the collar is like way too tight. And I'm pretty sure it's because I bound off the folded hem too tightly because like it it was the whole sweatshirt or the whole sweater was like rising up here with like the ribbing sitting against my neck like this so i'm working on rebinding off that collar but a little looser and i'm hoping it works better this time we'll see um but once i'm done with that i'm actually gonna like block it like pin it to some blocking mats because i cannot have this sweater riding up the way it is and i mean it's a really good sweater like i want it in my rotation you know so i'm hoping to have that to share in the future and then my other work in progress i can show you is this that i already showed you before um big rib alpaca not synthetic fiber amazing um, and all I can report is that I have an inch on the body. <laughs> That's it. I'm telling you, I've not been knitting very much. And I can't even show you the secret test knit that I've been working and struggling with. <sighs> but that's why we have spinning. That is why we have spinning. But before I show you my spinning, I'll show you some new things I've gotten. Because we don't follow a particular order over here. And if you're sticking with me, I appreciate you. Thank you for bearing with me. Also, thank you for bearing with me for like all of my format changes. Like I'm just trying to feel out what feels best. I'm always changing my like sound setup, my camera setup, whatever. But um, yeah, just thank you for bearing with me. So two things I've gotten recently. One is this beautiful beautiful lock spun mohair from Raina at a wild offering um, who I talked about a little bit last time uh, I just love her um, I love her like Instagram I love like how much care she has for her animals and also the colors that she uses to dye with um, this is four ounces from a goat named candy with a k yearling and it's like so incredibly soft like this i'm keeping this like this is going into a garment that i am wearing like this is this is like next to skin soft for sure and there's like blue teal cream um i love the look of lock spun like as cuffs on like a coat or a jacket um, but I could also see this like I don't know like if I would if I were to make like a sleeves like this then I could put it on like the bottom and it would just be like this fun little like fuzzy thing like kind of draping like over whatever else you're wearing um, I don't know I've seen a lot of people like use like really chunky yarns to make hats and I think they look really cute I just like can't have like thick fabric on my head like it's like too much warm on my head for me sensory wise and I don't know I just like patchy scrappy looking sweaters as well so I don't know I have like another couple of lock spun yarns that I've acquired over the years I have a few lock spun that I've spun myself um, some of which is going into that like funky sleeve that I'm making that I showed last time but some of which I'm kind of hoarding so I don't know I think I might just take all my lock spun and like make a lock spun like 100% lock spun sweater 
um but i feel like this one just like the colors are so nice that like i don't want to pressure myself to you know use it only in a lox bun sweater so this is going in the stash but we're going to think about how to best use this because this is very special yarn um <laughs> speaking of stash um a friend of mine um shared with me her notion for you know tracking her crafts and like i have another friend um who uses spreadsheets to track their hand spun and their stash hi annabelle um so i i'm feeling like oh my gosh i am like not like losing control but like like that's extreme but more like i don't want to feel like i'm drowning in stash or i don't want to feel like overwhelmed like i think that the nice thing about yarn is that it doesn't go bad like you can keep it for years and it'll be fine you just need to like you know watch out for mods but like it's fine it's yarn it's whatever you know and i like the act of looking at my stash every so often and being like hey like here are two yarns that you know go really well together or i just bought something that goes with something i had from five years ago you know that i didn't know how to use otherwise like i've really tried to like accept that without like you know leaning into like overconsumption and like overdoing things um so there's that but it also leads to you know you not always having a plan for your yarn which i think can get a little dangerous because then you just like have all this yarn that you bought with like kind of no purpose for it and you're feeling like unable to find a purpose for it so that's this thing i'm struggling with right now at least so i'm really inspired by my friends who digitally track all their stash and projects and everything and so i think i'm gonna start doing that myself um i don't know if that'd be interesting for me to talk about on here um but yeah i think i'm gonna play around with that a little bit and see how it feels and like I think it would be a great way for me to track my hand spun as well um knowing like how much yardage I have of each thing and I can like bookmark patterns and like note down the yardages needed for those patterns and then I can like match yarn to pattern that way so I don't have to just like take out 20 skeins of yarn on my floor just looking at them and hoping that one of them <laughs> like speaks to me or whatever um yeah stash we all have them it's like a belly button <laughs> anyway other new acquisition that i got is so i know i've talked about i want to kind of step away from superwash um, yarn with the exception of gifts so this is one of the exceptions because I would like to make a cardigan for one of my nieces. I have two baby nieces, they're so cute. And the older one, I made a Mar, what is the uh, Park and Knit Aqua Marlene for kids? Is it the Finley Marlene? The, yeah, the baby Aqua Marlene, like, you know, marled, whatever. Um, so I made one of those for the older one, and she's quickly outgrowing it, but before I can make her another sweater, I have to make the younger one a sweater, because as a younger child myself, you know, hand-me-downs are great, but, like, it's always nice to get, like, something of your own, you know, so I want to, like, alternate, like, knitting for both of them. So I got Moonstone, DK, um, Wandering Flock, um, really soft purples, pinks, creams, and i was gonna get like a neutral because you know as much as i love like bright bright colors like you know i understand like they don't go with everything and like whatever so i wanted to get like a really light like pastel kind of vibe so that it could kind of go with more things and let me show you the pattern that i want to make it's a mini pom pattern r.i.p to pom pom 
I was honestly so sad when I heard that. Like, and I, as I know many of us probably were, just like, for those of you who don't know about Pom Pom, I, I don't know if you exist, but like, for those of you who don't know about Pom Pom, they are a knitting magazine, um, print and digital, and all of their patterns that they choose are like always super unique, either in like the design or the construction or just the garment itself. Um, they have some really, really special patterns and like the models they featured and the designers they featured are like very diverse and like I always felt like I got you know a lot out of a pom-pom magazine and like having multiple I feel like you get a wide breadth of techniques and like perspectives and all their patterns are size inclusive um actually lackadaisical that I was talking about before the mitts um that's a pom-pom pattern so anyway they're so great and also unfortunately uh because in this world everything is so expensive including running a print publication they have to shut down and so yeah it's very sad i don't know if you can still buy pom-pom pattern book magazines if you can from your local yarn store i highly recommend it um, i cherish all of mine i'm working on a sweater from one right now um and they have mini pom, which are mini like kid size versions of pom pom patterns. Um, and I got this book from Rhinebeck. Um, and what's funny is Megan Fernandez was there selling them, but at the time I didn't know who she was. Um, or I didn't like for some reason know what she looked like. And so I just thought she was selling magazines or just manning the booth. So I was just like, oh, hey, what's up? Do you have this book? no okay can I get this okay thanks like <laughs> and now that like I am more aware and paying more attention to the world around me <laughs> um and I like you know checked out her Instagram I was like oh I saw you I met you and you're the pom-pom you're, you're the pom-pom person like hello and yeah I felt very silly um I have had many such cases happen to me <laughs> but you know it's it's a struggle. Uh, speaking of Megan Fernandez, she designed this pattern. Um, this is the Lobelia, mini Lobelia. Let me show you this page. And it's this like nice, like, I think it's Estonian star flake. Est Estonian star flower motif that like it I love a unique raglan like raglans can get so samey samey but like I love seeing like unique designed raglan patterns and this one has like cables in cables in the cuffs and the hem of the sweater and it's just such a sweet like heirloom style cardigan like for a kid like I think it's just it's so cute so yeah my niece is turning two this year so I think I'm probably gonna make the two to four year size so she can grow into it that's the thing with kids they grow so fast like m making anything for them is hard because if you make it for them at the age they currently are then they're just gonna grow out of it in like a month or two but Anyway, I think it's going to be like a really cute um, pattern yarn combo. Also, this was knit in Wandering Flock DK Merino, which is probably why I bought it. But um, yeah, it's nice to know that there's like no guesswork with like, regards to, um, you know, whether the yarn and pattern are going to match. But I haven't actually made a button cardigan before. Um, one of my projects in Purgatory, which I've been thinking about a lot lately and want to get back out my crux cardigan um that one isn't designed to have buttons neither is the plump cardi that I was wearing in my last podcast um and neither is the you on ua that I'm making for Jacob right now so my partner Jacob so this will be fun uh, because I do want to make a buttoned cardigan I um, have plans for a can-do cardigan which I will talk about in a little bit but yeah, I 
I guess this will be like a nice way for me to like dip my toes into, you know, buttoned cardigan making. Um, yeah, it'll be fun. Also because knitting for kids, like you can be like, I'm being a little bit more toned down with the colors just to be like on the safer side, but I'm excited to get fun and funky with the buttons. Um, I have some buttons that I've been collecting over the past few years in preparation for making something with buttons. Um, so we'll see if I have any. Um, and if not, then I'll just get some really cutesy ones. I also have Shrinky Dink plastic. I've never actually made buttons with Shrinky Dink plastic. I feel like it might be a little fragile. If you have any experience with Shrinky Dink buttons, please let me know. Um, I think for my gift for my niece, I might use like actual real buttons, but I do want to experiment with Shrinky Dink buttons for myself. Um, I think it'd be really fun. So, I don't know. That is all I had to show you. I know. I know, right? Um, I actually have finished objects in the form of yarn. Ta-da! This is my hand spun basket. Um, any skeins that I'm like proud of, I just like stick in this basket. I got this basket from like a yard sale happening down the street from me. Um, and I love it. I love this basket. I want to learn how to weave baskets. I want to learn everything. I want to get my little grubby hands dirty with all the crafts. But I don't want to show you all the yarn. I just want to show you four skeins. But that's right. I finished four skeins of yarn. So last time I showed you this boucle, right? Remember her? Love her? She's the best. Also, I don't think I said the fiber. This is Polworth. Um, Polworth wool. So we already saw that one. But did you know that I made two more boucles? That's right. I made two more boucle skeins. I'm going to go in order in, um, of when I made them. But this one I did kind of similarly to the last one, but I was trying to be more mindful about like the loops that I was spacing out. And I'm so happy with how this one turned out. It's so squishy. And some of these strands, like I, I was able to trap the loops evenly so that like, okay, if you don't know how a boucle is spun, let me just back up a little bit. It's technically a three ply yarn. There's probably other ways you can make it, but the way I'm doing it is it's a three ply yarn where the two of the plies are like a normal yarn where it's like the two of the plies are thinner. They're both twisted the same way and then you ply them the opposite way. But then you get a third ply, which is like spun thicker or it can be like uneven if you want. And that is spun opposite ply to the two thinner singles. And so what you do is you spin, I think my cat's trying to get in. <laughs> so what you do is you take a thinner ply, let's say it's Z twist, and then you take your, let's say S twist thicker yarn, and then you ply those together in a Z, I think. So opposite to the ply of the thicker. And so yeah, you're over twisting the thinner ply a little bit, but then you take that and oh and when you're doing that you're like loading coils onto the thinner yarn so those coils you're going to open up into a boucle in the third step and so in the third step you take your other let's say z twist thin ply and then you're going to ply it while you're kind of like moving the loops around and trapping them and that's what makes this loopy texture and so if you look closely at some of the strands, I don't know if you can see it when I'm just holding it up like this, but essentially it's like a two ply yarn and then like the loops are just like going between the each twist in the ply. And so yeah, some of the strands have like a squiggly like thing going on with the thicker yarn, which I absolutely love. Um, this is all targi um, nest fiber. The last one is also nest fiber. We love nest fiber in this household. And, oh, you may have noticed I put a yarn label on it. And you might have also noticed that it's typewritten because 
I got a typewriter. That's right, a typewriter. I have wanted a typewriter for a couple of years now. Um, <laughs> after I watched the typewriter fever documentary, I was just like, that's freaking cool. You can just type things like, and now that I have one, it's even more satisfying than I ever anticipated. Like you're printing the page while you're typing on it. Like what? Um, and so I have a Remington 1040, if that means anything to you. Um, and yeah, I just like started writing diary entries and I started writing yarn labels. Um, and it's really nice. Like, I don't need to worry about printing anything. I can just, like, type stuff onto a piece of paper and cut it out and boom. There you go. A printed thing. Um, I don't know how people show off their typewriters on YouTube. Maybe I'll watch some typewriter videos if anybody's interested in seeing my typewriter or making typewriter content. Um, let me know. I'm still learning it, though. So, I mean, I'm not, like, an expert. I can't tell you, like, how it works or anything, but I know that it does work. I bought it from a nice lady named Shelly in Port Townsend. Port Townsend, where I also met my new friend, Nico. Um, we're already friends on Instagram, but we're like new IRL friends. Um, and they're super nice. Um, they work at a yarn store there where they took me and I actually got some fiber from there as well. Um, so yeah, I guess I do have another new acquisition, but it's tucked somewhere way back there but I'll post a picture somewhere but yeah that was super nice it was nice to link up with them and it was nice to like meet them um I gave them my old drum carter um so yeah they're really into sheep and so I'm really excited to see kind of how they amp up their fleece processing game um if you're watching this hi Miko um it was really nice to hang out and while I was in Port Townsend um you know, the typewriter store that I went to, the lady was super nice. Um, she started this store in retirement. She showed me how to use it. She told me about it. She told me it belonged to a local guy who has passed. So yeah, I'm hoping it's not haunting the typewriter. I didn't get bad vibes off of it. Um, so I'm hoping for the best. <laughs> I don't know what I'm on about right now, but Point being, yeah, typewriter, we love it. Love it. Another new yarn that I made um, is actually with half, half of this yarn is the same colorway that I made the last boucle in. And then the other ply was a rambouillet. This was kind of like a bobbin clearing yarn, but I liked how the colors looked, so... I'm happy I paired them together. I'm still trying to like master the art of skeining. I'm I'm literally just like taking the hank and then I'm just like twisting it with both of my hands and then I'm, you know, putting it together, but I feel like this, the twist is a little uneven. So like, does anybody have any skeining tips? I don't know, cuz I feel like some of the parts are a little tighter than others, which I'm like, am I hurting the yarn? I don't know. But anyway, I don't know. This is a yarn that I actually thought would be like a DK weight. Maybe it is a DK weight, but it's like some parts are thicker. But and like when it's on the bobbin, it looks so much thinner. So I think I'm just getting used to like seeing how it translates from bobbin to um, yarn. Here's another um, bobbin clearing skein with like wild colors. So this is half Targi, half Rambouillet. The Rambouillet is the same Rambouillet as the last <laughs> um, yarn. And then the Targi is from a solids pack. Um, I think all of these are yes from Nest Fibers. Um, and the Targi like solids pack has, yeah, like bright pink, blue, brown, green, cream, uh, I, always say, I always say green, red, orange, I don't know, a lot of different colors. And so I had split up all the little colors into little nests and I was going to like spin them all together, but I wasn't really sure how all the colors are going to come together. So whatever I already had on the bobbin, I applied with this Rambouillet that's like pink, blue, purple. 
and I actually really like it like even all of the like olives and mustard yellows like it kind of all balances together um nicely so I feel like I'll, I'll probably end up selling this one I'm not really sure how I feel about keeping and working with it but I mean I am actually happier with that than I thought I'd be so I'm sure somebody will love it and then the last skein I want to show off is this Rambouillet. So pretty and it's so squishy. I just wanted to make like a spiral yarn. Um, I'm having a hard time like spinning thick consistently, but I think this was the closest I've ever gotten. And plus like I never want to be too like too consistent, I guess. I think that's boring, but um yeah this one's really fun i think it'll make like a really nice like bumpy fabric and this was colorway knee high to a grasshopper um just just springtime in a yarn like i i love it um yeah typewriting yarn labels has been really really fun and spinning has just been bringing me a lot of joy lately like i had i have times where i don't spin on my wheel a lot um but lately i have been just on a spinning frenzy um it's a nice break from being frustrated by knitting and also i could probably use a smaller project of knitting to work on like a sock or something like a hat probably um because yeah working on sweater after sweater after sweater can get very very mundane after a while but i am very excited about all my boucles so like I've got these two and I have another yarn that I forgot to show you another boucle this is a Targi Rambouillet boucle another like um not bobbin clearing but like this colorway no no no, no. this color I'm not sure one of the colorways I have um I think it was this one I did another uh, boucle with but this time I wanted to make it more loopy and like loopy instead of like curly looking so you can kind of see the difference between these two like I wanted this one to have looser loops than this one which had like denser loops um, so yeah I mean I don't know what it is about boucle that I love so much. Oh, look at that. Look at that one. Do you see that strand right there with the squiggles? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good stuff, man. That's what we want to see. I love it. Like, just IRL squiggles. If you know me, you know how much I love squiggles. But yeah, I just, I don't know if I'll use all these together, but like, I really could. I probably could. I don't know. Just that, like, textured fabric look. Um, I don't know what it is about boucle I like. I don't know if it's like the process of making it, the way it looks, the way it feels. Um, but yeah, textured yarns, like where you can really allow yourself to be like, you know, more inconsistent with your spinning is great. I mean, I already allow myself to be inconsistent in my like non boucle spinning as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love spinning. What else is new? I want to make more stuff with my hand spun though. For sure. So that's my stuff I wanted to show you. Um, I also wanted to talk about other stuff if you'd like to hear. Do you like reading? Because I just started reading again. Um, I just finished the audiobook for this book. Who is Wellness For by Friha Roshin. Um, and I liked it so much, I picked up a copy myself. Uh, I just needed to own this book. And it's like, it's a really great look at like trauma, disability, decolonizing healing. And like, this is written by a queer Bangladeshi Muslim person. Um, so, like, I really resonate with them. I really resonate with her. And just like how she approaches things and like her values and 
Um, a lot of parts of her story are very real to me. And I also love just this coming from a South Asian perspective, particularly looking at like Ayurveda and like yoga and like all of these kind of wellness practices that have been co-opted and commodified over the years when you know they really should be for everybody and like the people who need it most often have the least access to these types of things so I just loved how this book looked at how like individual healing is connected to community and land healing um so yeah I really recommend this um some parts can be really really like heavy um but if you're looking for a book about like healing and you know working through traumas um, I really recommend this book. And then what I'm reading right now was recommended to me by my friend B. It's called Hijab Butch Blues. And this book is about a queer Muslim person who grew up in an Arab country and then moved to the United States later. And it's a memoir about like her experience kind of navigating um, identity and faith and reconciling kind of these two worlds that seemingly don't align or work with each other especially like through community like pressures and stuff and this book also kind of shows how she rethinks her relationship with faith to work with her um, kind of like to work with her values and to rethink what she was taught in a way that affirms her queerness and I absolutely love it like as a queer Muslim myself like you know I might not be religious but I grew up you know with religion with faith and with all of these values that I had a hard time reconciling with things I was learning about myself and so you know being on my own journey in that regard it's really nice and gratifying and validating to hear about somebody from a very similar kind of background as me talk about her journey with it and so um even if you're not like a queer muslim like i really recommend this book um i'm halfway through it but i can already tell you i will be recommending this to everybody I'll, i recommended it to like three friends last night and i think it's it's a really nice way to uh learn about how you can reconcile faith with like you know queerness with justice and like a political um outlook or like a set of political values i guess like i feel like in like a lot of like queer spaces or leftist spaces you don't see um people openly engaging with faith it's almost seen as antithetical to those things but it really doesn't have to be and it isn't inherently and I mean I also have been on my own kind of journey like re entering or like reconciling with faith practices and spirituality and this book is really helping me get there so anyway it's a very personal read for me but it's um I love the way she wrote this um a lot of Kind of you know memoir stuff but then also telling stories from the quran so it, it's very interesting and um really engaging i really recommend it okay so that's all i wanted to share with you so hang out for a minute i'm going to get set up for spinning and i'll be right back okay we are back um my sound may have gotten a little quieter um i realized that with this microphone i have to like hold it right up in front of my face and when it's not right in front of my face it sounds a little quieter so I hope it's not too quiet but like I said we're just we're figuring it out as we go um so yeah I'm spinning on my Ashford P3 um I got this a little over a year ago um unfinished and unassembled and so I stained it added sealant or whatever you call it um which was, took a long time and luckily i um i was able to do it at my parents house um and they had the room for such a project so um yeah it took like a few days but 
now that it's all done, I don't really have to worry about it, especially because, you know, like, you're spinning on it with your feet, and, like, the oils and all are going to get on it and stuff, um, but I really like this wheel, um, I don't see myself upgrading or anything anytime soon, um, it works perfectly fine, we love her, um, I do hope to get a major craft rose something um either that one or i think it was another major craft um but it was the one i obviously don't know too much about like wheels and like which type does what but like when i was at rhinebeck last year i was able to try a major craft wheel that had like a long draw thingy like a part of the wheel like pivoted like this so that you could like draw really long and far for like a nice woolen spun yarn um which I thought is great because like you know drawing backwards this way and you're just like running into yourself constantly like it's not really that fun uh, but you know it's what you do when you don't have <laughs> a fancy wheel but yeah that's my like goal spinning wheel for sure um right now I am spinning an advent calendar for Valentine's Day uh, from Nest Fiber, and um, it came with 14 bundles of mixed fiber yarns, or whoa, 14 bundles of mixed fiber nests, I guess. And so what I did was I divided each of those 14 into eight little nests, um, by like splitting it horizontally and then splitting each chunk four times or into four pieces um, so we have about like 421 grams of fiber so I'm hoping to spin it to a DK weight so that I can knit a can-do cardigan and I told you I would talk about a can-do cardigan right um, so we'll see if I have enough fiber I do want to make an all hand spun can do cardigan though. Um, and just these colors are so nice. Um, I divided it into a quarter of the fiber needed. So I'll have like two, well, four bobbins of singles and then two bobbins of plied yarns. Um, but yeah, all these colors are so sweet pinks, purples, greens, teals. And um, if I don't have enough yarn um, output, from this fiber, then I'll probably just like use some of my other nest fiber um, colors to make some more DK weight yarn. Um, and then we'll see like what I do with like, I could probably stripe it or I don't know, like alternate rows or something. Um, you know, little tricks that knitters do to hide different colored yarns, you know? Um, but what else? What else? I don't know. I have like a lot of fiber to get through um, to make a dent in my stash. So I think I could stand to, you know, just have an excuse to spin up a bunch of my fiber, especially while I'm in this current spinning. Um, spring, I don't know, like a spinning groove, I guess you could call it. Spinning mojo. Does anybody have like a better word? Because I don't like either of those words. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I am in a spinning groove. But what well, one thing I've started doing recently is um, plybacks. Like, I never used to do that, but I saw that you can use your orifice hook to weigh the yarn down to help it twist on itself, which I think is a great idea. And this way I can see if I'm, I don't know if you can see that. This way I can see if I am actually achieving a DK weight, or you can approximate it at least. And that has been such a game changer for me um, in attempting to spin consistently. And honestly, like this fiber is probably not being spun super consistently anyway, because like I said, it's all mixed fibers. It's like a lot of different types, a lot of different breeds of wool. Um, and there's also soy fiber, there's silk. So there's just like a lot going on in here. And so it's not gonna be consistent. Um, anyway but this is like I think the most I'm attempting to spin consistently also because it's actually very hard to spin for a DK weight I'm realizing 
like I feel like a lot of different like there's a lot of different definitions of DK too like some yarns that are DK like are actually like a heavy fingering or like a light worsted or something you know but like a true DK weight I feel like is hard to like deliberately achieve and I'm doing my best like we'll see how it goes like those yarns um that I showed you earlier the bobbin clearing yarns I thought those would be DK but they're definitely thicker than DK for sure so we'll see how it goes. I'm very committed to using this for my candy cardigan though, or just any cardigan. So let's say it doesn't work out for the candy cardigan. I'll still use this yarn to like make a garment because that's what I'm intending this fiber for. Um, oh my gosh, the advent box is so cute though. It came with a bunch of little bookmarks. Uh, I'm using one bookmark in hijab butch blues right now. Um, and another bookmark in my mini palm book that I showed you. Um, and I love, love core. Love is an aesthetic. I think it's cute. Hearts, pink, all of it. Um, and there's this one Bollywood movie called Dil to Pagal Hai, which means uh, the heart is crazy or like the heart is like mad or with passion or whatever. And it, there's a song in that movie um, where they fill a room with like pink heart-shaped balloons and just that image of like Shahrukh Khan like batting away like pink heart-shaped balloons filling a, a room like I don't know with like the wind blowing them around like there's something so like magical about that shot that like has stuck with me forever and like I think definitely has helped inform my like love core sensibilities. <laughs> Um, so it's only fitting that, like, for me, that I, I use a Valentine's Day advent box for my cardigan project. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about that. So I was telling you earlier about Hundreds of Beavers, which I really enjoyed, but there's another couple movies I saw this year that I also really enjoyed. Um, I would really recommend. So... Perfect Days, uh, which is directed by Wim Wenders um, in German. They're W's, but it's German, so you pronounce it Wim Wenders. Um, he directed Paris, Texas, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. It's like, so Paris, Texas is from 1985, I believe, and um, it stars this one actor whose name is escaping me, but he... He's that kind of actor that like he has a bunch of roles in a bunch of movies throughout the years and anytime you see him you're like yeah that's we like that guy this is gonna be a great movie like he's great you know like a steen stealer kind of guy steen scene stealer like a scene stealer kind of guy um and anyway so it stars him um whose name i can't remember and there's just so many like like parts that make you want to like cry and there's like a lot of really pretty like lush colors and like interesting things with like lights like there's a bunch of scenes with like green lighting almost um and like uh there's like a lot of cool like cinematography done in that movie um and so he like I said he directed that movie but he directed this new movie that came out um last year or this year called Perfect Days starring Koji Akusho, who is a uh, famous Japanese actor, and he was in Cure, which is also a good movie, but um, Perfect Days is a very slow, like, meditative kind of movie um, where you follow uh, this guy, Koji Akusho's character, as he goes through his days, and he, like, goes to his, like, menial labor job, but then he, like, comes back and, like, I shouldn't say menial labor, but, like, you know what I mean? It's, like, like, um, so he's, like, a janitor, so it's, like, you know, that kind of, like, mundane, like, repetitive, like, laborious type of job, um, and so he goes to work, and then he comes back, and then he just, you know, he likes to spend his days doing things that make him happy, and he takes pictures, and he, like, listens to music, and he watches books, and you just kind of follow him through his days, and it was such a sweet movie like um i love a quiet type of movie that lets like moments breathe um and i also love just like how like intimate it feels in the t in terms of like you know these are 
moments of this guy's day that he only spends by himself but like you feel like you're right there with him and like it was just so good because like at the end of the movie I was like I wanted to stay in that world like I wanted to stay in there with him in that like in in his days you know and just those quiet like routine days of his where he gets to you know spend his he works so that he can spend his time doing what he wants even if it's just reading and taking pictures like you know like that's that's what life's all about like I work so I can buy yarn and fiber and so that I I can have you know the privilege to sit and spin all day like I so I really get that and like just also like slowing down and living a quieter life like is, is very appealing to me especially as I get older like I'm turning 30 this year so I'm just you know taking time to like appreciate like how life can be nice even when you're not doing like you know big big things or like big plans or anything like you can just kind of enjoy what you have now just did a ply back because I just added a new ball of yarn ball of fiber looking good so perfect days was really good also really good was the taste of things that movie was so beautiful um the director is the same as the director of the scent of green papaya which i'm really excited to watch i think it's on criterion but um this movie um is a french movie and it's about it's a period film set in like i think the early 1900s or the late 1800s and it's about um a, a famous chef who has a cook who cooks for him and his friends and just like their story and it was like the most beautiful like think like Miyazaki like food like anime food but IRL like because the director wanted to use real food for all the takes like um which means that they had to go through a lot of food but it also made all of the like food shots look real and look tantalizing and I just like and you could feel it like it was so like magical and dreamy and like I love food content anyway I love food TV social media content whatever and just like it was so good and like the emotions were so deep like I was literally like coming out of the theater like sobbing like I was so just like that was a very emotional movie but I loved it and both of those movies like I left I, I watched them back to back it was like a lot to experience back to back um it's turning out a little thicky um there's a lot to experience back to back but like now that I'm almost halfway through the year I'm like yeah those were the two best movies I've seen this year and I'm really excited to revisit them um and I really I really hope they come out with it on blu-ray soon so like yeah I I love cinema I love watching movies um I love like artsy movies and like movies that really like you know have like really beautiful and interesting visuals and um my partner is really into movies as well and we have like a it's mostly his blu-ray collection but we have a huge blu-ray collection because you never know when these streaming companies are going to take the movies off of streaming so you always want to make sure that you can control whether you have access to these movies or not within like reasonable capacity obviously but i'm really grateful that we have so many movies on physical copy because yeah i've, I've been burned too many times with movies take being taken off streaming. Oh, a new to me movie that I saw this year. Showgirls. I loved Showgirls. I loved Showgirls. And it was actually I think the best experience to watch this movie having like none of the cultural background on this movie and its legacy 
because like I watched it and I was like oh that was campy that was fun that was like absolutely like wild out there cuckoo bananas like funny like but ultimately like just a really engaging and compelling like movie like Elizabeth Berkeley's performance is like amazing and like Kyle MacLachlan plays like the sleaziest just like fuck boy kind of guy you've ever seen in your life like oh my gosh um yeah there were definitely some very hard to watch scenes I will not um <laughs> I will not lie but um that movie like it's wild because like it came out in like 1995 and people immediately were like this is like critics were like this is the worst movie I've ever seen in my entire life and it was like a mainstay at the Razzies and like people hated this movie like they were like this is like objectifying women and it's making women look bad but like the thing is is the movie is about how Hollywood and the entertainment industry exploits women and like women are always kind of in a position or being put in a position to be exploited if they want to get far and it's like even the successful women are like being exploited or prone to exploitation and like um and ultimately we live in such like extreme patriarchy that like like even the most empowered women like are subject to being disempowered and like you know being robbed of their agency and like their humanity and Ooh, so it's it's a it's a big movie and like anyway but it's just so sad like how like poor press this movie got that like it had to spend the next like 25 to 30 years like fighting against it or like first it kind of became like ooh like you know this is an ironic movie oh we made it to be funny or like we made it to be goofy and, like, I mean, there are funny and goofy parts, but I think, like, the parts that some people say are funny and goofy, like, the pool scene, and you'll know what I mean if you've seen the movie, like, I actually don't find those scenes as funny or goofy or satirical. Like, I mean, yeah, it's, like, over the top, campy, whatever, but, like, I I don't find it, like, like a comedy, you know what I mean? Like, I just, I don't know, like, they don't make... A lot of movies that just like take like aesthetic risks like over the top acting type of risks and it like works and I don't know recently like I there was like a clip I saw of like Elizabeth Berkley at like a screening for the movie and like she was getting a standing ovation because like essentially she was saying like oh the LGBTQ community has like you know brought this movie back or held this movie down or whatever and like you guys really saw this movie for what we saw it for when we made it and she was getting like emotional and I just that made me so happy because she spent pretty much her entire career after that being known as like oh she made the bad movie she was in showgirls like she was getting like humiliated for no reason because she did really good and it was a great movie and so I'm just glad that she's like getting her recognition now and kind of getting like vindicated I mean like I think she's been like a good sport about it this whole time even though she shouldn't have had to be um but anyway, point being, I'm just glad that movie's finally escaping its, like, bad reception early on, you know? Um, yeah, I love movies. I love cinema. And let's see. Um, ooh, tomorrow I'm actually going to go see a movie called Bye Bye Tiberius, which is a documentary about... Um, an actress named Hiam Abbas, who, if you've seen Succession, she was Marsha Logan's wife in Succession, and she's Palestinian, and the movie is by her uh, daughter, and it's about them kind of reconnect, not really reconnecting, but essentially it's about Hiam Abbas's story of leaving Palestine to pursue acting, and, you know, being Palestinian in the diaspora for the daughter who's making this movie and probably, like, coming to terms with, like, you know, or not coming to terms with, but, like, exploring and telling the story of, you know, their relationship to Palestine kind of living in diaspora and with everything that's been going on for the past 75 years and through now. 
So it just seems like a very like timely movie to watch um, to kind of honor the Palestinians. And I'm just really excited to also learn more about um, Yama Boss and just, um, it's just like a- amazing to think about how like, I don't know. It's, I, I think it's just, it's, it's amazing to see people follow their dreams, but it's also, I think, really nice to see how strong, like, the Palestinian identity is. Um, and I think we just owe a lot to Palestinians, you know? Um, they can teach us so much about resilience and holding on to who you are and being unapologetic about it. So, excited to watch that. And... I think that's all I have to say about movies. I haven't been really watching anything on TV recently. Um, just mostly watching our movies, um, reading my book, and oh, I've been taking more pictures lately though. Like, um, I have a few film cameras. I'm a collector. I don't know if you can tell, but I love collecting things. <laughs> and I have a little collection of film cameras. I've been really into point and shoots lately. I started on like I don't know what you'd call it, like a manual, like where you have to like advance the film with every uh, click. Um, and I still have that and it takes really nice pictures. Oh my gosh. Um, I think currently on my Instagram, I have a pinned kind of picture of me like with my ponytail and wearing a scarf. And that was taken on my uh, my Pentax kind of manual um, camera there. And it... I'm actually surprised that's a film picture because it looks very, very clear. So that's all credit to my partner for taking that one. Um, but anyway, lately I've been into point and shoots. So like, even if they don't have like kind of focus or they have like autofocus or fixed focus, like they still take like really cute pictures and they're just so easy to use. And like, there's no like guesswork of like whether like the film took or not. Um, so yeah, I've been really into those. I have an Olympus, uh, stylus zoom. It's my first, um, film camera and my most recent camera I've gotten. Um, my first film camera that has like a zoom capability or, okay, that's a lie. Pentax, my Pentax one has like a manual zoom, but, um, this one has like digital or electronic zoom. So like the lens comes out and you don't have to like twist it or anything. And then it also has a flash, like it's very fancy. Um, and it's a flash that you can like, it like comes out of the camera and then you can like put it back in the camera, it's very cute. And then I have a Pentax point and shoot as well, which I guess also has flash, but it's less impressive because it's just built into the body of the camera instead of like coming straight out. Um, but I wanna like, I take a lot of pictures and I post them on my personal Instagram, but like I don't post a lot on my knitting Instagram because I don't take many pictures of like knitting things so I'm gonna need to start like trying to take more pictures of knitting things so I have an excuse to post my film pictures Um, because I just I'm really I I love taking pictures and I love showing them off so oh I just realized I have my cameras behind me I think I was meaning to show you earlier but I don't want to pause my spinning too much so there's my Pentax point and shoot This one takes some really cute pictures and like it doesn't work fully all too well like the battery case kind of pops off so like the film doesn't always advance right away and I have taken multiple double exposures on this camera so it's not all bad I love a double exposure it's very like dreamy and then this is my Olympus stylus zoom Isn't that cute? I love this thing so much. My pottery teacher apparently used to have this, so that was really cute when they messaged me like, I used to have that camera. That's the thing I love about old stuff. Like, people have such a relationship with objects. Like, I have, ooh, hold on. Okay, I think we're good on the wardrobe side. I think we're good on the wardrobe side, but. Anyway, people have such a strong relationship with objects, you know? Like, you'll always remember, like, the camera you used to have when you were a kid. Or, like, 
like for me I have a strong like memory of like as I'm sure many people do of like my childhood blanket um which was actually originally my brother's um and it was like a poly like a polyester synthetic fabric or synthetic um fiber I'm pretty sure um quilt style blanket and it was like Because it was my brother's originally, the colors were, like, super faded, but it was, like, it had, like, pastel pink, blue, and purple, like, little bunnies all over it, and it was really, really cute, and I'm pretty sure, like, we lost it, like, um, after, um, going to, like, my cousin's house for a wedding when I was, like, really, really young. Um, I think it got left behind or, like, in the shuffle of, like, you know, a shabby house, like, it got, like yeah just like left behind and so I think just like it was weird because like one day I had it and then one day I didn't and that adjustment I think was actually like pretty traumatizing to me (laughs) um but I think I've you know would not internalize but like I've integrated that I think by just you know those are my favorite colors now and like pink purple blue um, we've gotten orange and neon green into the mix as well, as you could also tell by my new sweatshirt. Um, so, yeah, it's like that relationship with that object, I guess, like, I've kind of integrated that into my life. And, I mean, I even have, like, a t-shirt that I've had since I was three, three years old, little baby. Um, and it's hanging on my wall. And it's a little smiley face t-shirt that I think um, I, my mom was like in a Kmart one time with me in a stroller and I like grabbed this t-shirt and I just like grabbed it and held on to it. And it's just a yellow t-shirt with like a smiley face on it, like, like face on Nickelodeon, if you remember that. And, you know, because I, I picked it out. So she was like, okay, I'll get it for you. It was, like, way too big on me. It was, like, down to my ankles when I was a three-year-old. But, you know, now it's super tiny (laughs) on me. Like, barely covers my chest as a crop top. So it's just hung up right now. I've considered, like, cutting it and, like, immortalizing it in a quilt top. But I honestly can't even bring myself to, like, cut it. You know what I mean? Like, I have that strong of a relationship with with this shirt. Um, it's literally the oldest garment I have um and I can't even wear it you know or oldest not by like like it's from 1997 but so it's not oldest in that regard but it's like my garment I've had for the longest you know and so I have a very like strong I guess relationship with objects and it could be a neurodivergent thing too but I just I also really believe in like you know the spiritual and like I don't know how to say this like I think objects carry a lot of power and they have a lot of energy that they can bring or you can get a lot of energy from them and I just really I don't know it's the adornment thing in me you know like I think when you make your space beautiful, when you have something that brings you comfort, when you, you know, just when you have this object near you, like, you feel happier and calmer, like, I think that's all energy, and I think that's really powerful, and we shouldn't, like, discount the relationship we can have with objects. Not to mention, like, the memories and, like, the associations you have. Like, Um, There's this show called How To with John Wilson, which is a very, like, video um, documentary, like, or it's like a life documentary, like a slice of life, I guess you could call it. And um, it's really, really good. But there's, um, it's very stream of consciousness kind of show where he just kind of, like, takes, he, like, goes around New York filming whatever, and then he, like, um, kind of finds little like threads to follow like he'll meet somebody who's interesting and follow them for a little while then see something interesting and follow that for a while and so at one point he ends up at a vacuuming vacuum how would I even say this like 
you know how there's like fiber festivals and fiber conventions and stuff? So this is a convention for people who collect vacuum cleaners. And I just, like, as somebody who's part of, like, niche, like, relatively niche um, crafting communities, just seeing, like, this niche hobby community of, like, vacuum collectors was so cute to me. Um, and these people, like, a lot of them were like, oh, yeah, that's the vacuum that my grandma had. Or, like, when I was a kid and, like, my mom vacuumed, I was just obsessed with it. I thought it was so cool. And now I have that vacuum, and it's a great model, and I can tell you this, that, and the other thing about it. And it's just, like, so cute, you know? People are so funny and sweet and just passionate, and I love people, you know? People are great. It's so much fun. Like, people make objects, and objects give us a lot of things feelings and whatnot. I mean, that's why we make things, isn't it? Maybe. I don't know. I'm picking off these little bits of fluff. I don't know if you call it like wool nefs or whatever, but I'm adding them to my like little fiber pile that I use to felt hearts from. I still don't like have like a set use for those hearts. I just kind of like make them and then I'll like put them in my weaving or like, I don't know, maybe I'll do something once I have like a bunch of them because my, my fiber pile is getting pretty heavy there. So I'm going to need to felt some hearts pretty soon. You know, I don't normally spit and talk at the same time, but I'm realizing it's actually not that hard. Not as hard as I thought it would be. And I'm actually enjoying it a lot more than I thought it would be. So, I don't know. I know I just kind of talked about, like, movies and stuff, but, like, let me know if you like this or, you know, if you'd like to see something else from me. I'm really, like, feeling more inspired to make videos lately, like... I feel like I've gotten my setup a little more figured out and, um, you know, I'm hitting a more consistent groove of making things. So I feel like I actually have stuff to talk about. Um, but even if I don't like, you know, I like just kind of sitting and spinning. I'm going to be spinning anyway, like sitting, spinning, chatting, but let me know if you like it. If you want to see something else from me, I already said that. Um, and yeah, you know, I think I'm going to call it there because I have uh, friends to see tonight um, but can you see these colors so cute right so I'll probably have updates on that yarn soon but anyway um, if you made it this far thanks for hanging out with me um, if you want to see more you can find me on Instagram at soft.adornments and you know if you want to subscribe to see more videos um that would be cool um and yeah i hope you had a good time regardless and i hope you have a wonderful late april day and i'll see you in the next one